From inside of the warehouse at Oriel Park at Camden Yards, it is the Masson All Access Podcast. Paul Mancano and Brendan Mortensen donning an Apple Watch there, Brendan. Yeah. Do you feel more up to date, more in the know? I do. More apprised? I really do. Of all things in the world? I feel like I know what time it is. It, it's a lovely thing. You know, if I had been wearing my watch today, I would also know what time it was. But alas, you have to look all the way over here awkwardly at my left wrist to figure out what time it is. What else can you do on that fancy newfangled thing? No idea. <laughs> this is, I, I don't wear experience. it very often. No. I kind of forgot that I had it for a little while. And then I, I, I haven't really customized it. I, I don't know. I, I know it can do a whole bunch of stuff. I just, I don't know what. I remember when I was a kid and the calculator watches were becoming popular. And I remember thinking, this is it. We've, yeah. we've peaked as right. a society. Technology will never get better than this. Correct. And honestly, I I'd still rather, agree with that. I would rather have a calculator watch, I think, than an Apple watch. I'll go ahead and say it. It's not a bad take. Thank you. It's one of your better ones, actually, on this podcast. You, you know which take you hate, Brendan? Most of them? Most of them, yeah. Yeah. As evidenced by this podcast. Right. I'm a lima bean guy now, Brendan. Horrendous take. I've... Uh, I've rediscovered lima beans. Look, we've always been edamame fans. Sure. On this podcast, well-known edamame fans. And I saw, thought I'd dabble into lima beans. I thought this is probably a vegetable that gets a bad rap. It's one of those vegetables you lump in as a kid with, you know, Brussels sprouts and other vegetables that, uh, that you don't like and you don't enjoy as a child. And then you get older and you say, hmm, I do like Brussels sprouts. A little bit of maple glaze on that. I like a Brussels sprout. So Brussels thought, sprouts are excellent. That's so then why. then I thought, I'll give lima beans a chance. No. Because surely they're in the same category. And they boy, are not. boy, howdy, was I right. I mean, lima beans are not incredibly flavorful on their own. It's because they're bad. What I've determined is you can add great flavoring, like a Brussels sprout. You can make your own seasoning. And turn a, a lima bean into really anything that you want. Terrible take. You're telling me right now that you have to mask the lima bean. Brussels sprouts are good on their own, but you, when you add stuff to the Brussels sprouts, they're better. Yeah. Lima beans go from bad to tolerable if you just completely cover they, them up. I think that everything. lima beans have even less flavor than Brussels sprouts, though. That's my point. So, so you're not having to mask anything. You're just adding flavor. It's, it's like tofu, except way better than tofu. But with tofu, tofu doesn't have an, its own flavor. You're just adding the flavor to it. If you were to have plain tofu, like in a miso soup, yeah, you know, well, that's not plain tofu. Then it's in a miso soup, right? But you're not masking anything. You're just adding flavor to it. So you're not masking the flavor of a lima bean because a lima bean doesn't have a whole lot of flavor as is. Still a bad take. Let us know what you think. Lima beans, waffles, pancakes. Would you rather have, if you're asking me if I'd rather have lima beans or waffles, it's waffles every time. Yeah, but then you'd also, you know, be incredibly sluggish and would have a terrible metabolism and, you know. Well, that's, it. I mean, if I eat waffles oh, literally every time. All the sure. time, exactly. Yeah. You can't take it every time. You got to mix in some veggies, some green veggies, Brendan. Certainly not lima beans. On this podcast, we're going to be talking uh, about... The Orioles' eight players that they landed in the top 100 prospect list, according to MLB Pipeline. We're going to be talking about uh, some other teams changing their dimensions of their ballparks, Brendan. Yeah. That's fun stuff around the league. But first, let's talk about Darren O'Day. Longtime Orioles reliever announced his retirement yesterday. Brendan, this is a guy that uh, was a key piece in what was the best team in the American League for a five-year stretch. He was right behind Zach Britton in that bullpen in terms of great relievers to come out of the pen for that team that was the belt. The bullpen was the backbone of that team, and uh, he called it a career yesterday. Yeah, very nice career in Baltimore, very nice career overall for Darren O'Day. As you mentioned, the one-two punch with him and Zach Britton in the mid 2010s was excellent. O'Day appears in just under 400 games in Baltimore with a 240 ERA, a whip under one, which is incredibly impressive. Over 10 strikeouts per nine, only had 19 saves because, again, he was usually operating in that bullpen with Zach Britton, so wasn't getting the ninth inning very often. Yeah. But yeah, really nice career in Baltimore for Darren O'Day. Happy for him that he calls it a career, and it was a really good career. It was. I know near the end of his career, after he left the Orioles and he went to the Yankees, some Orioles fans took that a little hard because, you know, guy who spent the bulk of his career pitching against the Yankees in the 
AL East then suddenly has to uh, change jerseys and seemed very excited about it. However, his numbers in Baltimore were excellent. And somebody who came to the Orioles, that that was kind of a, a staple of that mid-2010 team was getting guys that were discarded by other teams and the Orioles finding value in that. I think of J.J. Hardy. I think of Adam Jones, who was traded for, but he wasn't thought to be nearly the player that he turned out to be. Hardy, some people thought the Orioles were not making a good decision by making Hardy their everyday shortstop. Manny Machado was the one who was a top three draft pick. He was heralded as going to be a superstar. I mean, Chris Davis came over from Texas, and he was not expected to be somebody who was going to hit 50 homers in a season. And I think Darren O'Day fit into that as well because he was designated for assignment. The Orioles picked him up off waivers from Texas originally. So he was picked up off the scrap heap. And even Zach Britton, who was already with the Orioles, but he was essentially a failed starter. Right. And that was just seemed to be the modus operandi of the Orioles at that point was they were able to turn other teams' rejected players into the backbone of the American League's best team. Yeah, which is funny because when you looked at the bullpen that the Orioles had last year, that's exactly what they did with their all-star and Jorge Lopez who had bounced around between teams, wasn't able to find a role anywhere. The bullpen was led by guys like Felix Bautista, CNL Perez, Brian Baker, who other teams seemingly didn't have a lot of interest in. They come to the Orioles off of waiver claims or minor league deals, whatever it might be. The Orioles were able to put together a bullpen of guys that other teams just didn't really want around the league. And I think O'Day as well, during that mid-2010 stretch, you have the 2014 division title where they get to the ALCS. O'Day posts a 170 ERA that year, a whip, I think, below .9. Which was just excellent. Yeah. So Darren O'Day, a huge part of those teams. And somebody who also reinvented his career by becoming a sidearm slash submariner midway through his minor league career was something that he had never really considered. He struggled with overhand, tried three quarters. That wasn't working a whole lot. Goes to the submarine pitch, and it turns out to be the best thing that he could have done for his career. Yeah. Brendan, I don't want to spend the entire podcast on this because we could spend 45 minutes to an hour discussing this. But when you look at the members of those 2010 teams, I just mentioned a few in Jones and Davis and Machado. When we look back on those teams after all these guys have finished their careers and retired, how many of these guys are going to be in the Orioles Hall of Fame, not Baseball's Hall of Fame, Orioles Hall of Fame, which has a much lower threshold, of course, in terms of quality of play, but it also involves being a fan favorite. Yeah. Do you think Darren O'Day fits into this category? And do you think that uh, a lot of guys from that era will be Orioles Hall of Famers? I think there will be a decent amount of guys from that era to be Orioles Hall of Famers. We've already seen J.J. Hardy. I I mean, Manny Machado should be in there. Adam Jones should be in there. Zach Britton should be in there. There's a few absolute locks. I think Chris Davis should be in there as well. Darren O'Day is tough for me because when you look at the value that he had on those teams, I would say absolutely Darren O'Day should be an Orioles Hall of Famer because of the impact that he had on a team that, like you mentioned, was the best team in the American League for a five-year stretch. The one comparison that I made to somebody else in the Orioles Hall of Fame in terms of a similar length of time in Baltimore is Greg Olson, yeah, former Orioles reliever. He appeared in 320 games, so fewer games than O'Day, but similar numbers. A 226 ERA compared to O'Day's 240. Olsen's whip was actually worse, over 1.2, where O'Day was under 1. The separator, though, is that Greg Olsen in Baltimore records 160 saves, and Darren O'Day only has 90. Right. Because he's pitching in the 7th, 8th innings, and Zach Britton is getting all the saves for that very good team. So based on the counting stats, I'm not sure if O'Day gets in just because it's hard to be a setup man and have the counting stats re- look yeah. really good. Like, it, the ERA is excellent. The whip is excellent. But when you only have 19 saves, that's oftentimes how you're evaluating a reliever, which isn't necessarily fair. 
because we'd put a whole lot more value on Zach Britton than Darren O'Day, not just because of the counting stats, but because of the saves. So I don't know if that's fair to O'Day, but it's hard to look at a reliever and put him in the Orioles Hall of Fame when he only has 19 saves. I think it's the the qualifications for the Orioles Hall of Fame, like I said, are very different from the Baseball Hall of Fame. And I think counting stats aren't as important here. But when you are considering the, the counting stats, another thing in, in Olsen's favor, I mean, he pitched for the Orioles between 88 and 93, sort of the beginning of the steroid era in baseball. He also finished, he had a season where he finished sixth in Cy Young voting. Yeah, he was a, an all-star in 1990. He was a fourth overall pick by the Orioles. So he was a highly drafted player. He won Rookie of the Year in 1988 and was an excellent closer for the Orioles. He also was a broadcaster after his career. So... I think Darren O'Day probably, you know, as an eighth inning guy, seventh inning guy, doesn't won't rack up the save numbers that Greg Olson did. But I think he did just enough, as just as much as Greg Olson to endear himself to the fan base. And I think that if you're putting in Zach Britton, I think, yes, Darren O'Day is a step behind, but I think it would be a nice thing to have both Zach Britton as your ninth inning guy in the Orioles Hall of Fame and... Darren O'Day is your eighth inning guy to to represent that bullpen. It would be, but I think I I think there's a gap between Darren O'Day and Zach Britton. Oh, certainly. In, in terms of certainly. their case to get into the Orioles Hall of Fame, I think, I don't know if it's particularly close between O'Day and Zach Britton. It also depends. I mean, the Orioles don't always put players in every single year. They didn't put anybody in 2022, I don't believe. In 2021, that was the J.J. Hardy class. Mike Devereaux got in. Joe Angel, you know, they always... Pick play a mix of players, coaches, trainers, broadcasters. They can really put whoever they want in the Orioles Hall of Fame. And I think uh, if Darren O'Day, especially if he comes back and maybe, I don't know if he will retire as an Oriole, quote unquote, if he'll sign a one day contract, um, or if he just makes a few appearances back at Camden Yards, if he turns into an Orioles ambassador, if he, I think he was pretty good um, speaking with the media. And uh, maybe that turns into significant for some significant maybe that turns into a broadcasting opportunity though as well you know because he's able to break down the game pretty well so I think that that might be something that helps his case here as well Nick Markake is another name by the way of guys in that group from that era that will definitely be Orioles Hall of Famers you mentioned Chris Davis I think Davis I know obviously the end of his career wasn't great but I think given his contributions in the middle of that run I think Chris Davis has to be in the Orioles Hall of Fame I don't know how many of these guys are going to be real Hall of Famers. I think the only one that really has a chance is Manny Machado at this point. You know, Adam Jones, not going to be a Hall of Famer. Marquez is not going to be a Hall of Famer. I don't know who else from that group besides Manny Machado has a case for the Baseball Hall of Fame. Yeah, I agree. I, I think at this point it's pretty much just Manny. I mean, Zach Britton was on a pretty good track and then just kind of didn't have the longevity throughout his career, has struggled with injuries over the past few seasons. I don't really see anybody else from that era making the Baseball Hall of Fame, especially when you're looking at the Hall of Fame right now and guys like Todd Helton can't make it. It's tough. It's tough to get in the Baseball Hall of Fame. It is. Also, Matt Wieters will be, I think, an Orioles Hall of Famer. Somebody suggested, I mean, he had four All-Star appearances with the Orioles in eight years. I know he never really lived up to the hype that was surrounding him uh, when he was at one point one of the top prospects in baseball, but I think given his contributions to those teams, I think he could get in. I think uh, it'll be a while before we see all those guys get in, but Darren O'Day retiring kind of you know, signifies now his opportunity to get in like Hardy did uh, a couple years ago. Right. All right, Brendan, let's talk about uh, one follow-up from last week real quick. Yep. Cole Irvin. We spent an entire podcast discussing the trade that brought Cole Irvin to Baltimore, and one main discussion point from that podcast was whose spot in the rotation would Cole Irvin take? Assuming everybody's healthy and you go into camp with Grayson Rodriguez, with Kyle Bradish, with Tyler Wells, with now Cole Irvin, John Means coming back in the middle of the season, um, Dean Kramer, whose spot would he have taken there? We said Tyler Wells was the most likely guy to have his spot taken in the rotation. We said... Wells is probably going to be in the bullpen. But we didn't address the domino effect that that would create, which is if Tyler Wells now moves to your bullpen, which one of the eight bullpen guys would you bump to fit Tyler Wells in? 
Yeah, and I think the starting rotation conversation was obviously the most important and most prevalent at that time because you just added a starting pitcher when it seemed like the Orioles kind of had five guys who were just set and good to go in that rotation. So that was the most important discussion at that point, but you're right. And I'm glad we had it. Me too. (laughs) But if Tyler Wells goes into the bullpen, that means that somebody else is out, which is weird because Tyler Wells is a right-handed pitcher who is probably going to eat innings for you. You kind of already have that in Austin Voth. But Austin Voth and Tyler Wells are two of the better pitchers on this team, and I think they are both locks to make this team because they're just good arms, regardless of whether or not their roles are kind of redundant. And when you're looking at the bullpen guys that are locks, a lot of them were already right-handed pitchers. Yeah. In Felix Bautista, Dylan Tate, Brian Baker, Michael Givens, Austin Voth, Tyler Wells. That's six guys that I consider locks to make this team, whether it is in the bullpen or the starting rotation, which only leaves you two spots for lefties. One of them is going to be CNL Perez, who again is a lock. That's seven locks in the bullpen already. Yeah. And then you have one spot that is kind of a toss-up between, for me anyway, D.L. Hall, Keegan Aiken, and then maybe there's somebody like Andrew Politi or Spencer Watkins or Bruce Zimmerman who sneaks their way in there. But I think it's pretty much down to D.L. Hall and Keegan Aiken for the final spot in the bullpen. Yeah, with the caveat that the opening day bullpen, like the opening day rotation and 26-man roster, is just that. It's just the bullpen on opening day, and the Orioles can tinker with it as much as possible. But yeah, if, if you are going into the season or going into spring training thinking these seven guys are, are locks and keeping that eighth spot open, like you said, Brendan, only one of those seven spots is a lefty, is CNL Perez. So do you are you committed to having two lefties in the bullpen? Gives you more options, gives Brandon Hyde a few more toys to play with out of the bullpen because putting it all on CNL Perez as your lefty specialist is difficult. It, right. It's asking a lot of a guy who, yes, was excellent last year, but doesn't have an incredibly long track record. So does that spot go to Keegan Aiken? And if it goes to Keegan Aiken, are you starting DL Hall in AAA and trying to make him a starter? And are you sending Andrew Politi back to his original team because he's a Rule 5 draft pick? Is Joey Crable not making this team? Uh, what do you do when Nick Vespi comes back? He's supposed to come back early in the season. He's another lefty that you would like to have in that bullpen. The only guys that that you know can't be really are on the outside looking in for this conversation. I think Darwinson Hernandez because he was the corresponding move. He was designated for assignment. If he sneaks through waivers, I think he could make the team, but he's got an outside shot because the Orioles just told us what they thought about him by designating him for assignment, taking right. him off of their forty man roster. Um, you know, Spencer Watkins. I think he's redundant especially if you have Tyler Wells and Austin Voth as very good righties who can either start or come out of the bullpen. That makes Spencer Watkins kind of unnecessary there. Yep. So those guys are on the outside looking in. But other than that, I think you have a solid group of four, maybe five pitchers that are competing for the eighth and final spot in your bullpen. Yeah, and we haven't really even talked about guys like Mike Bauman. Joe yeah. Crable, you just mentioned... Yanni or Cano, we're kind of assuming is not really in this conversation. We haven't talked a ton about Andrew Politi, just because there is the option that you can just send him back to the Red Sox organization if he doesn't end up making this team. And then Spencer Watkins and Bruce Zimmerman, like you said, the seven guys that I assumed were locks is, again, counting a lot of pretty good bullpen arms out of this conversation. I mean, you just put Noah DeNoyer on your 40-man roster. Does he have a chance to make this opening day roster? There's a lot of guys who are at least in the conversation, and it's hard when you have now Tyler Wells and Austin Voth kind of playing a similar role in this Orioles bullpen, but you can't leave them off the opening day roster. They're two of the best arms on this team. And of course, one, injuries are a factor, and two, it seems like almost every year we go into the, the spring training beginning and saying all these guys are locks to make the roster, and then somebody isn't. And then somebody falls off the map. Somebody has a really tough... Last year with Keegan Aiken. With Keegan Aiken last year, absolutely. Um, You know, it's happened in years past. I think the Orioles have a much better team going into Sarasota now than they did last year and the year before. So these guys are less 
roster fringe guys and more solid pieces for the future. You know, it would be a huge shock, I think, if CNL Perez, for example, didn't make this team. Something like that. Whereas last year, the bullpen was very much in flux in Sarasota. So anything can happen come spring training. Yeah, the way I see it with assuming that there are no injuries at this point, I think D.L. Hall makes the opening day bullpen with Keegan Aiken on the outside looking in. The only other real scenario that I see happening there is that the Orioles decide that they are committed to making D.L. Hall a starter this season. Not going to throw him out of the bullpen, whether that's at AAA Norfolk or at the big league level. So they start D.L. Hall as a starting pitcher at AAA Norfolk, have Keegan Aiken in the Orioles' bullpen, and then once D.L. Hall gets a call back up to the bigs, it's as a starting pitcher rather yeah. than as a bullpen arm. That's the only other scenario that I see for D.L. Hall potentially not making this team on opening day. Yeah, and who has options are a big factor here. I think Austin Voth is out of options. I think Keegan Aiken does have an option, so that makes him a little bit more valuable, but also more likely to be sent down to start right. the year. So that is going to be a factor as well, but a big conversation topic, and I'm sure Brandon Hyde, by the end of spring training, will be quite sick of getting questions about who exactly is going to make the bullpen Probably. opening day. Yeah. All right, Brendan, let's talk about the eight prospects that landed in MLB Pipeline's top 100 prospect list. Gunnar Henderson, Grayson Rodriguez, Jackson Holiday, Colton Cowser, Jordan Westberg, Heston Kerstad, D.L. Hall, Joey Ortiz are the eight prospects. Start at the top with Gunnar Henderson. Not yep. only do the Orioles have the best farm system in baseball, according to MLB Pipeline, not only do they have the most players in the top 100, but they also have the number one prospect in all of baseball. And I think what set Gunnar Henderson apart from the likes of Francisco Alvarez for the Mets and Corbin Carroll for the Diamondbacks was all three of those guys had been to the big leagues already, but Gunnar Henderson flashed so many tools. The defense, yeah. the versatility, the power, the ability to hit for contact, the ability to take walks. He flashed everything in the short time frame when he was in the big leagues. Yeah, Francisco Alvarez is a very, very good hitter, the catcher in the Mets organization. Not great defensively, so not surprised that he is not the number one prospect in baseball. I think the only other one that was in the conversation for number one was Corbin Carroll because he, like Gunnar Henderson, has five-tool potential. But as you mentioned, Cor Corbin Carroll did not flash at the big league level as much as Gunnar Henderson did. And I think people at this point are convinced that Gunnar Henderson, over the next few years, can turn into a player who hits 25 home runs, plays gold glove defense at either third or shortstop, and could steal 20 bases. Not a lot of players at the major league level at this point, or in the prospect rankings, that have that kind of upside. So yeah. not a surprise that Gunnar Henderson is number one. And not, it, it's not a guarantee that you're a star, that you're a superstar if you're the number one prospect in baseball. We've seen guys be listed as the number one prospect and not turn into a whole lot. But the odds are pretty good that you're going to be an impact player at the big leagues. I think of you know Mike Trout spent a brief time as the number one prospect in baseball. Of course, Adley Rutschman recently... Byron Buxton was the number one prospect. Shohei Otani. Shohei Otani as well appeared on that list. There are some superstars on that list. It's not a guarantee, but boy, is it nice to have the number one prospect in all of baseball. It is. It feels good. Yeah. Next up behind Gunnar Henderson is somebody who has uh, dipped slightly in the rankings. Grayson Rodriguez goes down to number seven, Brendan. He is no longer the top pitching prospect in baseball, according to MLB Pipeline. He's behind Andrew Painter of the Phillies. Somebody who I think was hurt by his injury. Yeah. And coming back late in the season, working his way all the way back up to AAA Norfolk, not debuting in the big leagues, and not looking as dominant post-injury as he did pre-injury. Look, as long before I see Grayson Rodriguez convince me otherwise, I still think he's the best pitching prospect in baseball. Andrew Painter... In the Phillies organization, excellent. He dominated the lower level of the minor leagues last year. He dominated the lower levels of the minor leagues last year. Grayson Rodriguez was pretty unbelievable 
at AAA Norfolk, especially over his last seven, eight starts at AAA, he was dominant. And he would have been, more than likely, called up to the big leagues pretty soon had that injury not occur. Grayson Rodriguez, I still think, is the guy. And I know he's below Andrew Painter on this list because of the injuries and because there's a little bit of an unknown there. In my opinion, he's still the best pitching prospect in baseball. Jonathan Mayo and Jim Callis, two guys with MLB Pipeline that are big uh, decision makers in who makes the top 100 and where these guys get ranked, have both said they think Grayson Rodriguez and Andrew Painter are 1 and 1A. And executives around baseball will put one guy ahead of the other, and it's really a split, but they had to put one guy ahead of the other. So it's really should not be taken as a knock on Grayson Rodriguez, the fact that he dropped behind Andrew Painter. It's just these guys are awfully close to each other in the rankings. Brendan, how about Jackson Holiday? Yeah. Coming in at number 12 in the prospect rankings. Could Jackson Holiday? Yes. Be number one by the end of the year? Yes. That's That was my question. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for, for asking my question. <laughs> I knew what question it was going to be. And yeah. I think the answer is yes. Well, Steve Molesky had an interview with Jim Callis recently that ran on all of our social channels that in which that question was asked. And boy, I mean, find somebody who talks about you the way Jim Callis talks about Jackson Holiday. Yeah. He is glowing about this kid. And it's amazing considering Jackson Holiday has really only had a handful of professional games under his belt. He's 18 years old. He has so far to go before he comes to the big leagues. But evaluators, talent evaluators, scouts talk about this guy like he is the next superstar and we are watching the rise of him. Yeah, and when you have a conversation with Jackson Holiday, you leave that conversation and you go, oh, he's going to be a superstar. He just kind of has it. It's, it's hard to describe, but Jackson Holiday entered his first half year of professional baseball, and he was exactly as advertised. Paul, you and I were at his first professional game. It looked like it was his 100th professional game. He just he jogged onto the field like it was just another game, went about his business, had a nice game. It just it seemed la-di-da for Jackson Holiday. No, no other profession uses the phrase goes about their business like baseball. Yeah. Goes about their business, you know? Hey, do you ever talk about a coworker that way? You're like, no, what's well, that's working? mostly because you usually do not go about your business. So I don't go about my business. <laughs> well, no one's ever like, what's it like working with Paul? And you're like, boy, he, uh, you know, he's grinding day in and day out. He goes about his business. You just never hear from he him. He really carries himself well. <laughs> You yeah, know? not things I say about Paul Mancano around the workplace. Oh, that's tough. So that's a yeah. personal thing. That's not just a profession thing. Right. Okay, yeah. that's fair. Yeah, um, Yeah. I mean, I, we have been fooled before by, you know, guys who can present well and, com, you know, come off well. That doesn't necessarily uh, mean that somebody's going to be a great player on the field. But when you marry that with the supreme talent that he has on the baseball field, it just feels like he checks every box. And something that stuck out to me in that in an interview also – Steve Molesky not only talked to Jim Callis, he talked to Jackson Holiday as well. And Jackson Holiday was talking about how his dad taught him to be humble, you know? And Steve said, it seems like if you had any trace of an ego, your dad would be able to uh, correct that pretty quickly. And that's what Jackson Holiday said. So it seems like his father, Matt Holiday, taught him well in terms of keeping his ego in check. But Brendan, you're looking at being the number 12 prospect. How do you go from being number 12 to number one. And I think a lot of it comes down to who above you graduates. Yep. Gunnar Henderson is right on the fringe of being out of this prospect rankings entirely because he is going to reach the threshold for plate appearances. So he's going to be the number one prospect for not very long. I think, what, two weeks into the season, he's going to graduate. Yep. So then we'll have a new number one. You look at other guys above Jackson Holiday who could graduate soon. Grayson Rodriguez, if he makes this opening day rotation... He's probably going to graduate by, what, mid-season, by May? Yep. Assuming he gets the requisite number of innings pitched. Ellie De La Cruz is expected to be a big leaguer. I think he already has made his debut. Is that correct? Not 100% sure on that, but he will be in the bigs this year. Yes. Francisco Alvarez, I think he's a little bit blocked by the Mets at catcher. After they acquired some catchers, they did trade James McCann. But well, they traded James McCann with the intent of getting Francisco Alvarez playing time. Probably. So he will 
he will graduate. But they also acquired Omar Narvaez, I believe. I think that was more to be a backup. Okay. I think it's Francisco Alvarez's job at this point. Okay. Anthony Volpe yep. uh, with the Yankees, probably going to get big league time, I think. Yeah, he'll be up in the bigs this year. Blocked a little bit by another top 100 prospect in Oswald Peraza, but right. Volpe will be in the bigs at some point this year. So then you're you're talking about a couple guys there. Uh, Corbin Carroll, I think, will be a big leaguer, is expected to be with the Diamondbacks. Yep. So Made his big league debut last year. Right. So you're looking at a lot of guys who could graduate ahead of him. But ultimately, I think it comes down to Jackson Holiday's personal development more than it comes down to who above him graduates. Yeah, I see four guys above him in the top 100 that will not graduate this year, I would imagine. It's going to be Andrew Painter, Jackson Churio, Marcelo Mayer, Jordan Lawler. I think are the four guys currently above Jackson Holiday who should still be on this list by the end of the season. Jackson Holiday, if everything goes to plan, I think could work all the way up to double A buoy this year. And I think if he is able to jump a few levels and shows the kind of plate discipline and prowess in pretty much every other aspect of his game that we have already seen, he should be at least a top five prospect in baseball by the end of the season. Yeah. But look at the rise, the meteoric rise that Gunnar Henderson went on last year. Yeah. Somebody who was viewed as a fringe top 100 prospect, I believe, to start the year. We, he was in the 90s, wasn't he? To start 2022, and he rose all the way up. I think he was in the 70s. 70s. Yeah. Rose all the way up to number one. So I think it it comes down to their own development. You know, I think if Jackson Holiday shows to be a superstar... Like you said, Brendan, I think that he could be number one pretty much regardless of what the other guys do. You know, he is going to have to be better than them to top that, but I think that's well within the realm of possibility. I agree. So beyond those three, you have three guys in the top 12. Then there's a little bit of a gap. Then you get down to Colton Kowser at number 40, who's holding steady. He was 40, I believe, coming into the rankings. He stays at 40. He is just a very solid prospect. I think uh, we've seen him be left off some other other lists. Cough, cough, the athletic. Don't know how he got dropped off the top 100. I think he legitimately forgot. (laughs) There's no other explanation. I mean, that is mind-boggling. He has a minor league OPS for his career around 900. He was the second or third player in his draft class to reach triple A. He was the number five overall pick. His draft pedigree. I think he legitimately forgot. <laughs> because there's there's no other explanation. He reached triple A, like you said. He's a five tool prospect. Yeah. He can hit he can hit for power. He can run. He can play center field. Uh, let's not forget that in that top one hundred, Cam Collier is also ranked above Jackson Holiday. True. And there are some so, there are some questionable Orioles decisions on that list. Not all top 100s are created equal. No. Uh, Especially not for the Orioles, 40, apparently. Yeah. 40 sounds about right. I think 40 is about right. I think he should be a little bit higher. I think the upside with Colton Kowser, I think, is there. I think people kind of undervalue the upside a little bit because Kowser has kind of been seen as a... He can do everything really well. Yeah, he's safe. But he doesn't have a huge upside somewhere. Sal Freilich is at number 30, and I think that is closer to where I would put Colton Kowser. Freilich was a little bit better, so I think if Freilich is at 30, I'd put Colton Kowser around like 35. I'm not going to complain over five spots. Was Freilich in the same draft class? He was. Okay. Yeah, and similar kind of player. He's going to hit for a high average. He has... Not a ton of power potential, but can maybe get you 15, 20 homers. Similar kind of player, but I would equate those two a little more evenly than the prospect ranking has them right now. College bat. Yeah. Uh, another guy who holds yet he who was holding steady, I should say, and another guy who's viewed as very safe, Jordan Westberg, number 74. Similar category. You know, can do everything very well, but doesn't do anything outstanding. Yeah, just not a super high ceiling for Jordan Westberg. I think this feels about right. All right, the next one, which is fascinating, is Heston Kerstad was not ranked in the top 100 coming into the new release of the top 100. He jumps all the way up to number 80. He was last in the top 100 
Shortly after he was drafted second overall in 2020, then he misses a full year. He misses the end of 2020 and all of 2021. Comes back at the beginning of this year. Only played in 65 games. Was DH'd a lot to get him off his feet. The idea this year was you're ramping him back up slowly because of how much time he missed and because of having myocarditis. To jump all the way up to number 80, to me, was very surprising. It was for me as well. I think Heston Kerstad is still a hopeful piece for the future. We have talked about him a lot over the past few seasons and have pretty much just come to the conclusion that you want him to be healthy. You want him to be able to just be back playing baseball, doing what he loves. And whatever you're able to get from him from his development just kind of feels like a win because this could have gone a lot worse and you're just glad that he's back and healthy and, and playing baseball again. I still view him as a hopeful piece for the future, but you just kind of penciled him in because there were so many question marks and you weren't really sure. He's at number 80 because of the Arizona Fall League. Yeah. He was excellent at the Arizona Fall League, was the MVP of the league this year. Jim Callis loves the Arizona Fall League. And he does. this is an example of putting a lot of stake in that. Too much? I don't, probably, but that's not a knock on Heston Kerstad. He no. was the number two overall pick for a reason. A lot of people think that he still has 30 home run potential at the big leagues, especially in a park like Camden Yards with his big lefty swing. So I still think the future is bright for Heston Kerstad. I still think he has big league upside. I don't know if it's 80th ranked prospect in baseball upside, but maybe you just saw enough in the Arizona Fall League to say he's back to where he was when he was the number two overall pick. Doesn't have center field ability. He's going to be a corner outfielder. Power hitting corner outfielder. There's there's a prototype for that. Power hitting corner outfielder who only hit five homers last year in 65 games in the minor leagues. Now, like you said, went on that tear in the Arizona Fall League. If he doesn't play in the Arizona Fall League, is he even in the top 100? No. I tend to agree with that. Because his minor league stats last year, they were pretty good. Hit 309. Hit 309 on the season. Wasn't as good as he goes up levels. But again, this was his first year of professional baseball after an absurd amount of time with not being able to work out, not being able to play. So it's understandable that he's going to need time to ramp back up. These are not knocks on Heston Kerstad. Not at all. Not at all. And what he accomplished this year, I think, was remarkable. He hit 233 with three homers in 43 games in high A Aberdeen. So like you said, Brendan, he incurred some rough patches once he got called up to high A. It was great in low A Delmarva, but he was a 23-year-old playing at that level. He's going to be a 24-year-old next year. We'll see if he goes to high A Aberdeen or to double A Bowie. But this 80th ranked prospect, does that change your opinion and your long-term view of where Heston Kerstad stands in this organization, where he was ranked in the top 100? Are we underrating him? Not really. It doesn't really change my thoughts on Kerstad. The top one, not that I know all of the information about these Orioles prospects, but the top 100 is more of just something for us to talk about, and it's nice to see other people valuing these Orioles prospects yeah. this highly. We aren't using it as gospel. We have seen these prospects enough and, and talked with whether it's Steve Molesky who knows a ton about the minor leagues or coaches or whoever it may be, Matt, Matt Blood. Blood. We have gotten a good sense of how the organization and people around the organization view these prospects, and that's kind of how I have viewed Heston Kerstad through the lens of a lot of people within the organization who have seen him. So this, him being ranked 80th in baseball doesn't really change my thoughts on him. I still think he's a hopeful piece for the future. We'll see if he starts this year at Double A Bowie. Doesn't really change my opinion, but it is nice to see other people around baseball viewing him highly. It's also an accolade that you can attach to somebody's name for a long time. Feels like anytime the Orioles would pick up somebody on a waiver claim. Jorge Mateo. Or a top 100 prospect. He was, yeah. Exactly. One of the top prospects in the Yankee system. We say it all the time. We're guilty of it. It's something that you can attach to somebody's name like an all-star, former all-star. You know, It's something that becomes synonymous with who they are at a certain point. And 
if somebody has that designation, there's some kind of thinking, whether it's misguided or not, that there is some potential there that, you know, as they go on throughout their career, could be untapped. It's like a, a high drafted player if he doesn't reach up to his potential. I think of Tim Beckham for the longest time, viewed as, you know, number one overall pick. So he is going to carry that weight with him wherever he goes throughout his career. For me, it's interesting because we talk about some guys in the Orioles system like they are big pieces of the future who weren't top 100 prospects. We talk about Kyle Stowers, who was never a top 100 prospect, and we strongly consider him a potential piece of the Orioles' future, at least their near future, at least right. 2023. We talk about Taron Vavra in a similar light, somebody who was never a top 100 prospect. Heston Kerstad is a top 100 prospect again. Yep. And whether it's fair or not, I think it adds pressure and it adds expectations from the outside that he will be a piece of this Orioles team going forward. The good thing is, He's not alone. There are plenty of other guys around him in this system that are top 100 prospects. So it's not like he's carrying the weight. I think of previously top-ranked prospects. I don't know if DJ Stewart ever made the top 100, but he was a first-round pick by the Orioles. He always carried that designation with him. And when the Orioles' farm system was at its lowest, he had to be the flag bearer when he was really not that good of a player in the minor leagues. He was really struggling. Right. And people were saying, well, he's a former first round pick. Let's get him up here. Let's see what he has to do, what he has to offer. So Heston Kerstad doesn't carry that much weight, but being the 80th prospect in baseball, and he could go up even higher if he starts out the season well and if other guys graduate, that might create kind of um, at least external pressure that he comes up to the big leagues and that he does something. Yeah, and it's also nice too, just from kind of an outside perspective to say, hey, other people in the industry believe this about Heston Kerstad. This isn't just our little Orioles thought bubble here. And within the organization, we think that Heston Kerstad has a ton of potential. You're going to say that about a lot of guys. But it's nice that other people in the industry who are looking at a whole bunch of different teams are now evaluating these guys and saying, yeah, Heston Kerstad is one of the best 80 prospects in baseball. Yeah. All right. The other guys on this list, two more. D.L. Hall, number 97. Joey Ortiz, number 99. And you're talking about D.L. Hall dipping. You're talking about Joey Ortiz on this meteoric rise. Two guys going different directions right now in the prospect rankings. I think this will not be an issue for very long for D.L. Hall because assuming he does make the big league team, he's in the bullpen. Come opening day, he will probably graduate early. But, Brendan, this is a trend that we've seen because D.L. Hall, not a nightmarish 2022, not a great one. Yeah. If it were me, I'd rank D.L. Hall higher than this. I think the stuff is still incredible, and I think the upside is still very much there. But last year raised a good amount of concerns with D.L. Hall, so it's understandable that he is here at number 97. Joey Ortiz is a prospect that we have talked about for a while now that is just kind of finally getting his flowers, which is nice, because you looked at Joey Ortiz's numbers from a season ago. I didn't get a chance to make the piece, but I had written on my whiteboard in my room for months that I was going to do a story on how Joey Ortiz could potentially be a top 100 prospect because you looked at the numbers last year. You saw the OPS at AAA Norfolk. You saw the power numbers come back once he was feeling close to 100% from his injury. And then you combine that with the defense. And we have heard from pretty much everybody in the organization. I think Matt Blood even said that Joey Ortiz has the best shortstop glove in the entire organization. You combine that with an OPS that was creeping up towards 900 last year, that's a really, really good player. And Joey Ortiz finally getting some recognition. It's nice to see. Can we get a Snyder Cut release of that piece, Brendan? It may be. Just yeah. make it a square version and just make it four hours. Don't cut yeah. anything and just give us the raw Joey Ortiz top 100 prospect piece. Yeah, I think it was it was literally just like an idea that I had at the end of last season. So that is at least how long I have thought of Joey Ortiz as a top 100 prospect. I made a Joey Ortiz piece a couple years ago too. Yeah. Just, just so you know. Pretty good. When he went on an Adley Rutschman's debut with the 
then short season single A Aberdeen Ironbirds. Joey Ortiz went like four for four that night and stole all the headlines when Adley Rutschman, I think, went 0 for 5. Yeah. Bust, Adley Rutschman, let me tell you. That's what they say. <laughs> Never made it. It's a that shame. That's what guy. they say. All right. Uh, very impressive that Joey Ortiz made both Baseball America's Top 100 and MLB Pipeline's Top 100. Yep. Two guys that missed the cut that I think, once we see graduations, could get Top 100 status. Connor Norby, Kobe Mayo. Yeah, they made the top 100s for other outlets. We saw Connor Norby make the top 100 in Baseball America's rankings. We saw Kobe Mayo make the top 100 in Baseball Prospectus rankings. We also saw Cade Povich today make the top 100 on ESPN rankings. Cade Povich was in the 50s on ESPN's top 100. Cade Povich was 54. I don't play for ESPN+. Plus. No, but if I did, I would love to see the explanation as to, to Cade Povich being 54. Not that I don't think Cade Povich is a good prospect. We were talking with Matt Blood. We keep plugging that podcast. Go listen to the podcast where we had Matt Blood live here on the couches. I asked him about Cade Povich because it seems like around the industry and around the league, people seem to think that Cade Povich is kind of a back end of the rotation sort of guy, but... Seems like the Orioles and apparently ESPN's top 100 seem to believe that Cade Povich has even higher upside than that. So nice to see Cade Povich getting some recognition as well. Not sure how close he was on MLB Pipeline's top 100, but I think that Connor Norby and Kobe Mayo, I would be shocked if they were any higher than 110 if you got an extended cut of this list. There were other pitching prospects in the Orioles system I would have put ahead of Cade Povich probably. I mean, Seth Johnson. I mean, you Seth Johnson, hard to evaluate because of the injury, but yeah. yeah. But certainly when you talk about high ceiling prospects, I mean, Povich, for all of his ability, didn't have a very low ERA last year, 4-5-0 ERA between single A and double A, and he got moved around. I get that. But also, little exposure to double A, he had an ERA in six appearances just south of seven. So he yeah, struggled. I think Chase McDermott is currently ranked higher in the Orioles' top 30 than Cade Povich is. Yeah. So a little bit surprising. It's very, very surprising, I yeah. would say. Um, but, you know, different outlets have their have their own opinions of these guys. But thou, that now makes 11 different Orioles <laughs> on a top 100 yeah. list. When you combine all the different outlets, that's 11 Orioles. And as soon as Gunner graduates, maybe not as soon as, but shortly after, I think we will see a Norby or a Mayo make this list. And seven of them have made every top one. Well, six, if you don't count. Six, if you're counting the athletic Colton cows are not making that top 100. Yeah. I'm not. So I'm going to say seven prospects have made pretty much every top 100. So we saw the Orioles trade one of their shortstop prospects and Daryl Hernays in the Cole Irvin deal. I saw a comment earlier on YouTube as we are live on Facebook and on YouTube every Wednesday at 11 a.m. that... Which of these prospects, which of these eight, would be the most likely to get dealt for a veteran, for a proven big leaguer? I think the lower you get down the list, the more likely it is that they are a trade piece and not a piece of long-term piece of the future. Right. I would agree. I think I would be shocked if you're moving. At, well, they're not going to move Gunnar Henderson, Grayson Rodriguez, Jackson Holiday. I don't think that's happening. No. I think the trade possibilities start with Colton Kowser. Yeah. But that would have had to be for, I think, a pretty high-end starting pitcher around the league. We thought it was a possibility when Pablo Lopez was on the trade market. He gets traded for a proven big leaguer in Luis Arise. If somebody like Corbin Burns is still on the trade market, maybe Colton Kowser goes in a deal there. I think the only way he gets moved is for an established big league pitcher. I think you can make a similar case for Jordan Westberg, even though he doesn't have the same kind of prospect status that Colton Kowser has. In terms of who is most likely to get dealt, even with the Daryl Hernandez trade, I'd probably still say Joey Ortiz. Yeah. Just because the Orioles have so much depth at shortstop, and you're even looking at these top 100 rankings, there are three shortstops in the top 100 ranked higher than Joey Ortiz. 
And not that he's not a valuable player. I think he could be a good big leaguer, but he's just the most likely. And the arrow is pointing up on Ortiz. I think right. teams can dream on him and say he already has an elite glove. He can play shortstop, second base, third base, and look what he did offensively last year. This guy could be a really good player for us. And all of these infield prospects, as of right now, seem to be blocked. You already have Adam Frazier as your second baseman, Ramon Arias as your second baseman, third baseman, Gunnar Henderson as your shortstop, third baseman, and Jorge Mateo as your shortstop. I don't know if there's room for any of these guys, whether it be Westberg, Ortiz, Norby, to come up and be a big leaguer. And in the outfield, you already have Hayes, Santander, Stowers, and Mullins, and McKenna that could be blocking Colton Kowser. Yeah. All these guys are blocked right now. Again, this is... We talk about it every single time. This is the conversation we always seem to have Yeah, where guys are blocked and then injuries happen and trades that you aren't expecting happen. For me, personally, when you have all of these top 100 infield prospects, I would prefer to see the Orioles try to move established big league talent versus some of these guys. I would rather see the Orioles trade somebody like Jorge Mateo or Ramon Arias at this point, at least for me, than trading somebody like Jordan Westberg or Connor Norby. That's just how I'm viewing it at this point. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It depends on whether you want to take the swing on the upside or if you want to go with the you know high floor of somebody like a Jorge Mateo. Yeah, and there's, again, a legitimate case to be made that if Joey Ortiz turns into a gold glove third baseman with, what, close to four war, like Ramon Ria said last year, that would be maybe best case scenario for Jory Ortiz. Right. And then you're saying, you why know, did you trade, trade the proven the commodity? He got the gold glove. Right. And already had the the three and a half war. Right. Um, interesting discussions to be had. And as we get closer to spring training, I can't wait to see these guys in spring training games with the big league camp, all that good stuff. Brendan, I did tease it at the very beginning. I don't have a whole lot to say on this, but I wanted to throw it in there. Sure. Other teams are changing their ballparks. Yeah. And guess what? The Orioles weren't the only ones. And I know the Orioles weren't the first ones to do it. But Detroit, Toronto are both changing the dimensions of their outfield walls. Everybody's doing it now. And guess who was first? They weren't first. But guess who was early in the trend? The Baltimore Orioles. And now everybody's doing it. They're not doing it as drastically. <laughs> but they are doing it. Absolutely. They're doing it. And they're doing it in different ways. Detroit yeah. is moving their, their walls in. Right. Obviously, Baltimore moved their left field wall back. Uh, Toronto, I was trying to understand. I need to uh, see a visual of this because I was trying to read about how their their wall is getting moved around. It's pretty pretty wonky. They're re- really just changing the heights of the walls. I don't think they're... Uh, they are moving, I think, left center and right center back a little bit. Uh, left center being moved in, right center being moved back, I think. We're just going to have to see it because yeah. in Toronto, it had been just the same height wall all the way across and it was pretty much just, you know, a, a semicircle a quarter circle going all the way around. Yeah. And yet none get... of these teams are taking my suggestion of making the outfield wall super soft so and you padded. can just, like, run full speed into it and nobody gets hurt. Why, why is nobody taking my suggestions? I won't say it, but maybe it's a bad suggestion. <laughs> could be. Yeah. It certainly could be, but it would be fun. It would be fun. It would be squishy. It would be like it would be squishy and it would be fun. Bounce you. I know I have yeah. a friend who um went to one of those bouncy things and I thought, boy, that's like it's for kids. It's you know, he went in like college and um I think he probably was a little bit uh, inebriated because you think those are like really safe. They're meant for kids. Yeah. Broke his leg. <laughs> All I'm saying is <laughs> it would be So I'm saying that that they're it's not as safe as it may appear. But I don't think it. any outfield's gonna be inebriated. Listen, I'm not a scientist. I don't know how to make it No work. one's claiming you are. No, that's certainly not me. <laughs> but I'm just saying it would be fun to have the walls be super soft and then Cedric Mullins can just go, wee, and then he runs right into it and he's fine. Let us know what you think. Should the Orioles bring in Should some anybody in baseball take my brilliant idea? Foam outfield walls. Or keep ignoring me. Um, I think we know the answer there. Thanks sure so much do. for tuning into the Mass and All Access podcast, which you can watch and listen to. Anywhere that you get your podcasts. Thanks so much to Amy Jennings for producing this. Her flu game. She's she's putting up through a lot. She's just yeah. had a, a rough 24 hours. So good for Amy. Thank you so much for uh, for pushing through and helping us out here on the Mass and All Access podcast. At Brendan Morty is his Twitter handle. Mine is at Paul Mancano. And of course, uh, follow us on Twitter at Mass and Orioles. 
Give us five stars, rate, review, subscribe, a thumbs up as well on YouTube and on Facebook. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we will catch you next time.